Albert Schweitzer, theologian, musician, and missionary doctor in Equatorial Africa, one of the great humanitarians of our time. Jose Ortega y Gasset, preeminent Spanish philosopher who led intellectual rebellions against dictators and kings. Robert Maynard Hutchins, president of the University of Chicago, a humanist who sought to create world unity at the dawn of the atomic age. These three were part of a movement advocating a revival of humanism after the horrors of World War II. They would be brought together by Chicago industrialist Walter Pepka and his wife Elizabeth in the unlikeliest of places. understand what Aspen was like when we first came. Aspen was a ghost town. A drunken friend of mine said, Pussy, you would love Aspen. It's Victorian. Nothing has been changed. The people's fled the valley. They're empty houses full of old Victorian abandoned furniture. Walls are standing, but roofs are leaking. It is a shambles, but the skiing is wonderful up there. I felt that this country was gorgeous. Elizabeth often rhapsodized about her 1939 visit and finally brought Walter to see Aspen in the spring of 1945. He had the idea of creating here in this lovely valley, this beautiful small village, which had slept from the time of the fall of the silver dollar to slumber like sleeping beauty. And it didn't wake up until Walter came and tried to give people jobs which would give them money to give them housing, clothing on their back, and food in their stomach. At that time, we thought it would be very interesting if it would be possible to have a renaissance of that type of community where some of the three, or the only three probably, parts of man's life, namely the economic, the cultural, educational, and the physical, could all be enjoyed without having to go far afield. Walter Pepka developed his plan for Aspen's revival and called a meeting of the town. And Walter lectured him, or talked to them on this, and said he'd like to bring a new way of life up here, which might make them all happier. He would start by rebuilding old houses, which would give them jobs. And then, since they had all the recreation they needed, he didn't have to provide that. But he wanted to provide something for the inner life and therefore, he would try to bring up music. Well, of course, everyone shook their heads. They weren't going to have uh, outside people coming and telling them how to live. They'd lived up here. They'd gone through a terrible depression. Everything had gone from them. Most of them were on remittance and dole. They weren't going to have some outsider come up here and give them a new way of life and say he had a message. Do you blame them? Undaunted, Walter pursued his vision for Aspen. His ambition was grand and went well beyond rebuilding the town. He saw an opportunity to make Aspen an American cultural center. In 1949, two professors at the University of Chicago, went to President Hutchins and proposed that we have a Goethe festival at the University of Chicago to celebrate the bicentennial of Goethe's birth. Well, Hutchins thought about that and went to Walter Pepke, one of his trustees. And he went to Walter Pepke because he knew that Walter was devoted to Goethe. In fact, my memory, early memory of Walter was that he could recite whole passages from the Faust in German eloquently and well. And said, Walter, why don't we have this in Aspen? 
After the Second World War and the popular rejection of all things German, Hutchins and the Goethe scholars thought it important to honor the great German author as a universal thinker who could help bring the world together. That Goethe lived two centuries before the rise and fall of Nazism made it slightly less controversial to celebrate the better aspects of German culture. Pepka and Hutchins viewed the self-sacrificing Dr. Albert Schweitzer as the greatest living example of Goethe's principle. They persuaded him to make the long trip from Africa to headline the event. It was going to be a global celebration of global humanism and the unity of mankind. The Goethe Bicentennial was very much an expression of the idealism of the post-war world and uh, Schweitzer as a kind of moral idealist certainly embodied that. Pepka commissioned architect Eero Saarinen to design a tent amphitheater for a meadow on the edge of town. The Minneapolis Symphony performed with conductor Dmitri Metropolis. Albert Schweitzer inspired an audience of artists and intellectuals, including playwright Thornton Wilder and author Thomas Mann. The world-famous classical pianist Arthur Rubinstein agreed to participate despite his strong antipathy for Germany at the time. 2,000 people made their way to Aspen for the 20-day event. The Goethe Bicentennial was an outstanding success. Albert Schweitzer would go on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1952, and Aspen would become much more than a ski town. At the end of that convocation, a petition was passed around by many of the public and also the participants, urging that this may not be allowed to die with one summer, but that there would be a continuing summer activity of an educational and cultural sort. Uh, therefore, the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies was founded in the fall of 1949. We tried our best at it, and in, the, in August, I invited, with Walter's support, uh, Harry Luce and Claire Luce to come to Aspen, take part in these seminars and lectures. Well, Harry said to Walter, look, Walter, they were classmates at Yale. You're doing the wrong thing here at Aspen. These great book seminars are attracting librarians and teachers. They can do that anywhere else in the United States. You're, you're missing the opportunity to reach the great intellectually unwashed in the United States. Who are they, said Walter. And Harry said, the American businessman. And out of that came the idea of the executive seminars. Well, you know, it's been said that the average American businessman is so busy with the urgent, he never has time for the important. And therefore, he has a little trouble he runs a good business, but he has a little trouble deciding what are the important things in life, what he believes in, and why he believes in them. But this is basically to make broader human beings out of the leaders of American life. We are not against specialists at all, but we think it would be wonderful if a specialist would also have a broader view of his contemporary life and therefore be a, a more helpful citizen to his contemporary society. And I can't think of a man uh, who represented the best aspect of both business and culture in this country. Walter was an extraordinary person. With their visionary work toward the town of Aspen's renaissance and the creation of the Aspen Institute, the Aspen Music Festival, and many other ongoing institutions, Walter and Elizabeth Pepka demonstrated a deep commitment to the advancement of humanity. Today, the Aspen Institute acts as a kind of public commons. It offers a place where people with different outlooks can meet in person to debate, to search for the common values and then the common ground that helps them pursue solutions to the challenges of our time. Our Aspen Global Leaders Network reaches across 43 countries. That's our Young Leaders Initiative based on the Henry Crown Program. And the idea is that these young leaders can move from success to significance. From a tent in a meadow and the Goethe Bicentennial in 1949, the Aspen Institute remains committed to the important mission the Pepkas began 60 years ago. <laughs>